people become vegans or plant-based eaters, uh, you've heard the story, I've heard it many times, people worry about whether or not they're getting enough protein of the right kind. The right kind. Protein has, has been, I'm going to argue, has really been at the center of our minds almost as we think about food and health, much more than a lot of people realize. It's kind of directed our thinking as to what, in fact, we should be studying, how we should even uh, promote health, how we should eat, of course. What we learned in an extensive series of studies over some 27 years, actually looking at many different ways, we learned that we can basically turn on and turn off cancer development in experimental animals. The amount of protein that we actually need is an essential nutrient, is somewhere around 10% or so of total calories. 95% of us get some more than 10%. So that, that, this is really fundamental. I don't have time to get into the details of this, but this goes right to the heart of what, in fact, is Western medicine. And one of the flaws that we have in Western medicine, it really goes to the heart of what science is doing as opposed to what nature has done. This, this is something that kind of immersed in my mind and kind of had to struggle with. I really had to struggle with because coming from the background that it did, it was just sort of countered to everything I've been taught and believed and lived and you finally have to start coming to terms with this. Of 144 studies that we found, uh, looking at the effect of fruits and vegetable intake on cancer, of the 144 studies that were significant, every single one showed that these foods tend to reduce the risk of cancer. Do you think we need to do another study to see if fruits and vegetables you know, reduce cancer risk. And nutrition is so important, it keeps, keeps kind of things under control if you're doing it right. If you're doing it right, if you're consuming the right kind of nutrients, provided by the right kind of foods. Um, and as I mentioned just before, the evidence of a little bit of the evidence of nutritional modification controls even reverses cancer development. We've got a lot of evidence when you think about this thing from a holistic point of view, all of a sudden it starts to make sense. Just to, again, if you get some of you who maybe haven't heard this kind of evidence before, uh, let me just quickly summarize here. It's going to blow your top off, I think, for some of you who haven't seen this. There's a list of diseases and ailments. Some, of course, are serious diseases, a lot of just sort of bothersome ailments, if you will, um, that occur because of imbalance in the, in the consumption of animal plant-based food. It's that simple. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff there you can see. I mean, if people go to a total plant-based diet, relying to some extent on my medical colleagues to share with me some of the experiences they've had on this, as well as, of course, the research that published in the literature as well as our own. I mean, it's really spectacular. I, I mean, I think this, this plant-based diet idea becomes so enthused for it. It really is almost, it's, a, it's almost heresy to say this, it's almost, a, it's almost a panacea for really resolving you know, many of the health problems that we have, at least in the dietary sense. It also promotes severe physical fitness. Wonderful stories here, wonderful data, going back more than 100 years, showing that elite athletes around the world, when they consume a plant-based diet, they achieve better and superior athletic performance, world-class uh, status, in fact. Uh, most diseases and chronic ailments, with the last slide to show you, are caused by insufficient consumption of whole plant-based foods. What I'm trying to build here is that what we're talking about is a really whole world view of the way we should eat. It has got to be recognized. People have got to understand this and start to stop picking it apart on one little detail here and detail there because a lot of times that's, that's really not appropriate. Um, and so I'm going to just now just put a couple slides here for what we did in China. We went there to see what, what was it that breast cancer, for example, about a dozen other cancers tend to be so common in certain parts of China and not in others. And we ended up with a huge pile of data, you know, a very comprehensive study in many ways. We measured everything under the sun we could think of. Blood samples, zero samples, food samples, analyzed in all different kinds of ways. So there were, there were actually about two dozen different laboratories around the world who got involved in this study comprehensively. It just turned out that even small amounts of animal food started to appear in the diet. Cholesterol started to go up, cancer started to appear, heart disease started to appear, and on and on and on. So here's a question that S pointed out, right, I think, or somebody that you can speak of it. Uh, namely said, why, just maybe we'll open up the opportunity for some discussion, why, why do almost all health healthcare plans, and that's all we hear about these days, I hear tell that except for the Iraq war, 
that the number one item for, for consideration on the part of voters the next in 2008 is going to be the health care crisis. You know, as, as I say, except for the right war. But you look at the programs that these politicians are putting together, and all they're talking about is they're trying to figure out who's going to pay the bill. I don't see any of them really talking about anything seriously. You know, about how to promote, you know, health in this country. I mean, you get lip service to it, of course, you know, walk upstairs and, you know, park further out in the parking lot and things like that. But they're not really getting into the question concerning the, the enormous effect of nutrition on creating and maintaining health, restoring health, preventing disease. Where do we go from here? I'd like to hear some ideas. I've got some ideas here in yours. Yeah. and the recommendations that are being made to practicing physicians. The problem is we don't have any large controlled studies that show these results that are widely accepted. And all we see is uh, confounding information coming out over and over again in the press. What we need is we need to see some studies and unfortunately there's nobody, nobody interested in doing a study like this because there's no money to be made off of it. But yeah, we, need, question, we need studies that with hundreds or th perhaps thousands of patients who are put on this diet and then we see the dramatic effects and there's no way that it's scientists gonna are going to argue about that. I was at a um, breakfast with 200 health and benefits brokers, these are people who sell employer sponsored insurance, as well as the CEOs of four um, health plans that are in charge of the Oregon health plans. I stood up at one point and uh, asked why are we not putting greater access? The, the, the question that you asked at the end, why do we keep talking about single payer versus multi payer and reforming universal health care? Why instead are we talking about uh, encouraging promotion? And literally in front of those 200 brokers, one of the CEOs said, Can I address this? Prevention doesn't work. What I'm finding is really on the employer side, those small employers who, because of that 87% increase in the cost of health insurance since 2000, are desperately in need. This is the fastest growing cost for those employers. They desperately need a way to continue to offer benefits to their employees and to control the health care costs. And I think if we can get um, small to medium sized employers doing these preventive things, encouraging their employees to have healthy behaviors, showing that they care about their employees, not by offering them less health insurance, but stuff that's really going to keep them healthy, that's the way that we're going to start transforming a lot of the things. There is a great book out right now called The Bloodless Revolution uh, from Cambridge by Trish Tram Stewart. In the book, he proves unequivocally that we are agrarian-based, and it's a historical work, starting from the Brahmins in India, going to Pythagoras, the greatest vegetarian of all time, moving all the way through time. There's a lot of things we can debate and kind of prove whatever we want. You can take it to wherever you want. Take it to yourself. Make yourself your own living laboratory. Do your own work on yourself. Do some of the tests that we're talking about trying to bring to bear here and try to host the bloodless revolution in your own life. You will see a difference. You'll see a difference in your practice with your people. You'll see it actually in your own heart. You'll open up your heart. You'll see there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. The reason was tabooed 500 years ago during the Renaissance at the time of, I don't know if you guys are into this, but the 1600s, there were the diggers, the, it's called the family of love. These people were all burned at the stake pretty much, and they tried to show the governments, basically in Britain, that if we went agrarian, everyone would have food, there would not be any famine. They didn't want to hear that. They wanted to control the people because you who controls the food controls the people. If you want to take your own destiny into your own hands, study what they're talking about, learn how to cook these things. It's very simple. I mean, it's, it's not real preachy. Our cookbook, our first cookbook, Vegan World Fusion Cuisine, people said that's a little bit much. So we did a seven minute chef for people who can download it. Seven minute chef so we can just get it across. And within seven minutes, you can get all this information out. Our next book we're calling The Nano Chef. Get it out there for the people. Listen, you guys have been awesome. Your friends just begun. Come to this recipe.